The, the lesson for this evening is called, Who is this guy named Jesus? And um, we tend, tend, not that that's the way everybody does it, to just read the Bible. We open it up and say, okay, now let me see. I'm going to read 15 or 20 verses. I want to finish one of the stories. And we don't see how it fits into the larger picture. We just, you know, there's a guy born blind, and he gets his sight, and they investigate the healing, and so that's a story. And it's sort of just like stands alone. But there's a story of him feeding 5,000, and how many stories are there like that? Four. Exactly. Each gospel. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well done. <laughs> is there, how many places is there the story of his transfiguration? I think it's only one of the gospels. Or two. Three. Three, okay. Mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke. That's right. Mm -hmm. How many birth stories? Three, one. Uh, Luke. Luke is Mary's story, yeah. and, then and Matthew is Joseph's story. So it's that kind of thing, all right? It's to give you sort of a bigger picture of how this whole thing fits together. In fact, one of the tools that we use when we do this kind of a study is called the Gospel Parallels. And what this is, is a, a place where the each of the books is written in a straight line alongside the text of another gospel that has a very similar wording. And so it says right here there are two gospels that have that. Now we call any place where it's got two gospels side by side, but not the third one, we call that one Q. Just a interesting way of defining it. But there are some places where there's only one because there are unique sources from different ones. And then there are places where there are three. Okay? And in many, many places there are three complete columns with very similar wording. Now we'll be looking at that and kind of say, well, why does it seem like there are three separate stories that almost all are looking identical, and yet sometimes Luke has something that nobody else has, and sometimes Mark has something that nobody else has, and sometimes Matthew has something that nobody else has, and sometimes it's just Matthew and Luke. Weird, huh? How does, it, how does that make sense? So we'll be looking at that and kind of giving you an overview of, you know, some of the uniquenesses of each of the Gospels, why were the different Gospels written? For instance, just as an interesting question, did Luke ever meet Jesus? He wrote the story of Jesus. Did he ever meet Jesus? No. No. Never did. I can't remember even what time frame Luke was in. Mm -hmm. I thought Luke was just in the Louvre. <clears throat> he came into the faith about midway through Paul's ministry. If you're if you're reading the God, the book of Acts, it was he went here, he went here, he went here, he did this, he said this, and then suddenly there's a big switch, and it's we went here and we did this and we said this, and suddenly he joined the missionary journey. All right. So, just a, an interesting question. Why would this guy, who is Gentile, not Jewish, why would he write the story of Jesus? Why would that be so unique to a Gentile perspective? It's a, ah, we're going to answer that question. He's a, much more. he's a historian too. Well, he was a historian. He's his doctor. He was a wonderful historian, so detailed. His stories have so much 
inborn detail embedded mm -hmm. into them that it's better than Matthew, and he lived there. Yep. <laughs> and Matthew just doesn't have the same depth of detail of where Jesus was and what it looked like. Luke came back and walked every inch of the path. He went everywhere. He, he actually became a breathing part of the early church. Well, of course, Jesus was already going by that time, so he couldn't, he could go to the empty grave, but he couldn't see what Jesus was doing hanging on the cross, that kind of thing. Matthew was one of the twelve. Matthew was like, hey, how you doing, Aaron? Matthew was one of the twelve. Was Mark one of the twelve disciples? Yes. Was he? No. No, it was John. No. No, he wasn't. So why would he write the story of Jesus? I'll be answering that question. <laughs> okay. He was with them. Um... Paul at one point, and they split. Or yeah, he, he went part of the yeah. way through one of the, uh, one of the missionary journeys. Uh, travel didn't suit him real well. Let's just say it that way. But anyway, he was young. Paul, and, yeah, Paul and Silas. Yeah. Um, Paul got a little upset with him. You know. mm -hmm. Not going to do this to me twice, you know. First time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. Well, yeah, the end of that kind of thing. Anyway. Regardless of all that, now, now that's, those are just the most basic kinds of questions. We're going to walk through this thing and just see. But I want to start with the Gospel of John. It says the Gospel of John in your Bible. Does the book we call the Gospel of John ever call the writer by name? No. So how do we get that it was the Gospel of John? They say the one who Jesus loved. He was the beloved disciple. Yeah, the beloved disciple. And it's the only way he refers to himself, the beloved disciple. Mm -hmm. What I call it is Jesus' best friend. You, you, we don't use beloved disciple like that anymore. But BFF, that's big. Okay? <laughs> that's who Jesus loved. He had a very special relationship with this Jesus. Oh, I'm sorry, Aaron. I've been doing the same routine. Kyle, these are the, the handouts for this week. Then we have a video um, syllabus from last week. If you didn't pick up one of the syllabi. syllabi. The first group of uh, the... Um, first group of lessons, there are parallel videos for each one of the lessons. And so I've given you the address that you can key in um, any video you want to see again, you want to ask questions or whatever, it's, it's there. So you've got a whole, the whole shooting match is there. All right? So let's start with a few introductory remarks about how John is so tremendously unique. How do we know that Jesus had a ministry of three years, approximately, a little more, a little less? How do we know that? Does it ever give us a timetable as to what time Jesus started, or when he served, or how long he was before he was crucified? There is a timetable. What was that? I believe there was a timetable, but it wasn't very direct and saying, like, this time of year or this time of month. Mm -hmm. we, we have to dig it out, Brian, and then you, you're right. It's in there. But where would we find it? Where would we look if we were going to say, how long did Jesus minister? Luke. The Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. Because, and here's the way we dig it out. He went back to Jerusalem for the festival every year for three years. Now you wouldn't say, well, it doesn't say he was ministering for three years. There's nowhere where it actually says it in so many words. 
But if you listen to the fact that he's going back to Jerusalem for the festival, going back to Jerusalem for the festival, how many times does he go to Jerusalem for the Passover in the other three Gospels? Only once. Only mentions it once. Only once. Isn't that interesting? And they didn't go with him to Jerusalem three times. They only went once. Wait a minute. This sounds a little too strange. If they were his disciples, weren't they supposed to follow where he went? Isn't that part of what a disciple is supposed to do? <clears throat> Just interesting as it might be, Jesus when he had 12 followers, said to them at one point, I'm going to send you out two by two. And I want you to go into every little crossroads, every little village, every little town, and I want you to tell them everything I've been saying. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to restore the sight to the blind. I want you to raise the dead. I want you to cast out the demons. I want you to just do everything I've been doing. And he gave them the authority to do it. And the way they went, Jesus was alone. He went to the festival. Later, more disciples around him, and now totaling 72, he takes them, he separates them two by two, he sends them out, go tell the good news every place, Every place you go, don't take any coin, don't take anything, any provisions, don't take any food, don't take an extra jacket, don't even go any place, just the Lord will provide. Go out there and just tell the truth about what you've been seeing and hearing. Jesus went to the festival. <laughs> okay, you follow? Is there an internal conflict? Well, there is until you look at the overall view of what this person of Jesus was all about. So... When we actually look at Jesus, I don't have one of those handouts with me, but I'm going to let you kind of give me a, a, a clue there how to start. We're going to begin in John, and what I want you to do is pay particular attention to voice. You know what voice means? What would the voice be? The way the, the passage or the message is being said. Yes, exactly that. Who's the one doing the talking? The writer. We'll hope so. Okay. In John, it is. John, it is. Why does John not tell a birth story? Why does he not tell about the uh, transfiguration? Why doesn't he tell the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? All things that he wasn't present for? I'm sorry? Are they all things that he wasn't present for? There you go! Exactly right! A point, A plus for <laughs> Chase. <laughs> all right. Why is that important? Because in the Gospel of John, he makes it an absolute, guaranteed point of absolute certainty. I will only tell you what I have seen and what I have heard. I am not going to give you any stories that are just hearsay. I'm going to, if I was there, I'll tell you about it. If I wasn't there, I won't tell you what it was. And several times he goes through and says, this is so that you can absolutely know for sure. Because I am a personal, first-person singular testimony. Okay? Do any of the other Gospels say that? No. Matthew wasn't at the birth. Matthew wasn't out the temptation in the desert. It says of that. How many disciples were, were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? We had, to, he had the inner, in, he had the inner three. Oh, yeah. We're doing fine. Look, I'm doing this just to stimulate your thinking cells. All right? And there's no wrong answer. There's no wrong answer. I'm just trying to get 
Okay. I guess there's no other way I can actually say this any better. In the Gospel of John, because he insists on only telling you what he has seen and heard, it is so clearly a first-person testimony that it's almost like he has taken a very tiny microphone on a long cord from 2018 and stretched it back through time down to 30 AD and set it on the table in the upper room where Jesus is going to have the Last Supper. And we can hear the actual conversation. Just like it was recorded on tape. It's that clear that he is the expert witness to tell us exactly who said what and why. Now, that causes us all kinds of problems. It's an excruciating thing to listen to the Gospel of John because there's a whole lot of stuff that go, really? How did he get there? How could he be in that spot? He walks into the fortress that is held by the Roman soldiers and walks right into Pilate's private chambers and listens to Pilate and Jesus have a private conversation. Now, how do you get there? How can you possibly report that as though you were there and heard it? Isn't that weird? even weirder. He actually goes into the Sanhedrin in the inner chambers of the Supreme Court building of his day. That's what it was. And he listens to each one of the priests telling about what they're going to do as they try to put Jesus to death. How do you do that? real quick. Because John is so weird, <laughs> so different than the other three, because he is so much, the, the character of Jesus is so much more robust, exciting. There's a whole lot of people that say, don't believe John, he's just a kook. He tells a whole different story. It's almost like it's a different Jesus. Don't, don't, John's the undependable gospel. The, 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 one of the phrases that I had when I was in seminary. Well, John was written some 300 years after the death of Jesus because it has such an elevated Christology. It took 300 years for people to finally get to the point where they would say, He is the light. He is the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That took 300 years for this to develop and you know, lift up this great high Christology of Jesus. Do you know what he's talking about? He thinks a lot of Jesus and really feels like he's God's son, okay? Did it take 300 years to come to that conclusion? That's what the scholars did when I was going to seminary. It was written way after the point. It was, well, you can't believe all of that. If you read in your Bible, in that paragraph at the front of each book, you're probably going to read some of that same stuff. Very popular. You know why? John's weird. It's easier to explain. It's easier to explain. <clears throat> there were things that he said Jesus did that could not possibly have happened. So he had to make it up. Then you have to throw the whole book out because he claimed he would not say anything that he hadn't personally witnessed. If he didn't witness it, then he's lying. And the whole thing goes in the trash. See how easy it is? Maybe. You just take John out and you rip it up throw it <coughs> Okay, this is so much fun. I'm sorry, I'm having way too much fun. Thomas Jefferson, by the way. He did that very well. 
He had an exacto knife, though. He didn't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> did he, did he, cut out things he cut out things he didn't agree with, mostly miracles. Right. 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 Chris, yeah. if you cut out one side, you also cut out the other. Um, and it wasn't the first one. 300 years, there was a Gnostic uh, heresy. And um, he one of the Marcion or somebody had like that. I, I haven't studied the Gnostics for a while, but uh, he went through and took out everything that made Jesus Jewish, any kind of reference to Jewish. He wanted Jesus not to be Jewish. Anyway, he's not the first time that kind of stuff. But I want you to understand. Let's just. I want you to love John and the Jesus of John as much as I do. Because I think this is really, really cool. I want you to turn, if you've got your Bible open there, and you're someplace close by. In the first chapter, verse 19 and following, we read these words. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. Verse 21, they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Now, who's speaking? What's the voice? John the Baptist is one of the voices. He's the one giving the answer. And we have investigators from Jerusalem. But who's writing it down? He's in the conversation. You follow? This is a first-person witness of the conversation the Jewish leaders are having with John the Baptist. Could it, been in, could it have been in public? Yeah. Anybody could have heard it, okay. But it was very detailed. They said this, he said no. They said this, he said no. They asked this, he said no. I am the voice of one crying. You see how detailed it is? He is an expert in the law and testimony. He's an expert in building a case. He is a legal expert. He knows how to build one idea on top of another, just as the rabbis of his day. Okay? Let's go on down for just a little longer. <clears throat> I baptize with water, John replied, verse 26, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one whom you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Now, Verse 28, this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where Jesus was baptizing. Now, when we start talking about the Bible, we start talking about Jesus, we start talking about some of these things. It doesn't hurt to have a picture in your head of how this thing fits together. I'll get out of the way so you can see. <laughs> but this is what we know as the Holy Land. All right? This is the Sea of Galilee around Capernaum. Remember where they went fishing and the storm came up and Jesus went out walking on the water. Well, that was right up here at Galilee. All right? The Jordan River twists and turns down through a rift valley, which means it's direct from Mount Hermon up here all the way through to the Gulf of Aqba. It's a rift valley, which means it's opening up and getting wider all the time. But because it's getting wider, the the earth is settling down lower and lower. It's sinking at the same time that the plates move apart. It sinks. And so the Dead Sea, which is down here, has no opening. It has no place to go. It is 1,900 feet below sea level. All right? The Mediterranean Sea over here is much higher than the Dead Sea. In fact, one of the ways they plan on refurbishing the Dead Sea 
is that they can can't canal yeah, all the way from, there. from the Mediterranean Sea and refresh all the water that's been evaporating out of the Dead Sea. But not to pump it. <laughs> They're pumping it like crazy. No, but it's, 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 it's good on the side. The Dead Sea is yeah. a huge chemical factory. All kinds of gold, all kinds of precious metals, all kinds of rare earth and metals. The Dead Sea is one gigantic chemical plant. All right. I meant they went up the pump from the Mediterranean there. It's well, go downhill. You have to go over some mountains. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, so Jerusalem is just about even with the top of the Dead Sea. All right. So if you're if you're putting some things together in your minds, you say, okay, now where is Jerusalem? Well, I see the Dead Sea here. It's almost directly west of that. All right. Jericho sits kind of down in the plain right along the uh, Jordan River. Okay? This is Jordan over here, Israel over here. The West Bank is kind of in the middle this way. <laughs> and this is Mount Carmel. Uh, do you remember what Mount Carmel is famous for? Uh, There's a great prophet who went to have a showdown with some prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Oh, I like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. On top of Mount Carmel. Okay? Just kind of coincidentally, see how it sticks out into the Mediterranean? Mm -hmm. Where did they get the 12 barrels of water to put on the sacrifice after three years of drought? It's, the it's an interesting question. Mediterranean sea. It never runs dry. Yeah. You could have the most extraordinary drought you ever wanted to have. And the Mediterranean Sea would never run dry. So he went, he sent them down the hill, and they dipped the 12 barrels out of the ocean, out of the sea. And it's just interesting. When you know the geography, it, it becomes more fun. All right? Now, that's, this is the Red Sea that the uh, Israelites went across. And this is the area around Mount Sinai out here in the desert, where the mountains and everything, where Elijah went to hide and all the other ones. The plates okay. are pulling apart at the Red Sea, too. What was that? The plates are pulling apart at the Red Sea, too. Yeah, that's another, another Rift uh, Valley. Rift Valley, yeah. yes. And Nazareth is up here. This is where Jesus spent his youth. Up here by Galilee, in the Galilean territory. And we have a, we have a lot of interesting things here. Now, just for information, this is Jerusalem. Okay, so when we're going to be talking about Jerusalem, this is what you're going to have as kind of a diagram of that all behind you. Know. <laughs> this little square right up here is the temple. That would have been the third temple during Jesus' day. The first temple was built by Solomon, Solomon in about 900, somewhere along that, years before Jesus. Uh, that temple was completely destroyed when the uh, Israelites were taken to Babylon as captives. They spent 70 years there. They came back and they built a little tiny ugly one where the beautiful one from Solomon had been. It was embarrassing. It was so ugly. That when King Herod the Great, who was trying to be the great architect of all time in history, said, I'm going to actually make a beautiful temple. He actually expanded the temple compound from about this big all the way out to here. And he redid everything, including the entire wall. And this little piece of the wall right over here on this side is what we call the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. It is still the same wall that Herod the Great built back about 20 or 30 years before Jesus was born. Okay? So Everything, I'm sorry. It's still standing too. Oh yeah. Oh, and it's massive. Mm -hmm. There's one stone down at the bottom of the foundation, down on the level where the street was that Jesus would have walked on, that is 70 feet long. It is the longest carved stone anywhere in existence. And it's in the foundation of the temple that, that Solomon built. And every stone that he made had his own signature on it. So you know exactly which stones were laid down by 
Herod the Great and his team of architects. They have a two and a half inch band carved into the margins all the way around the edges of every stone that he laid down. Very unique. That's the temple. Now, this, in David's time, this is the temple up on top of the hill. It takes two hands to do this. This is a very high hill. All right? How do you build a temple on the top of a hill like this? Carefully. <laughs> you do a very, very good job of building a perimeter wall and then filling in the inside so that it gets to be a flat spot that you can build on. Okay? So when Herod the Great expanded this, it's going downhill, 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 downhill. He puts this gigantic wall here. There are at least three separate levels of archways that support this end of the temple compound. It's huge. In order to get a flat spot that he can put a temple on. And across the end of it down here, it's called the Solomon's Colonnade. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful place. This is the Supreme Court building of the Jewish Sanhedrin, right here. And this place right here at the corner of the wall is called the Pinnacle of the Temple. You remember what that's all about? Where that was refer re reference came from? The temptation. The temptations of Jesus. Jesus went to the top, or Satan took him up to the top. Mm -hmm. And said, throw yourself down, it'll be a great spectacle. Everybody will be really impressed. And the reason why is that's a very high spot. Okay? This is a big mountain here. This is a huge valley. The Kidron Valley is this gigantic gorge. Then over here is Mount... Uh, <laughs> The Mount of Olives. And it's even taller than the Temple Mount. It's, it's this huge mountain over here beside. And this is completely covered with Jewish graves. Almost the entire side of the mountain is completely covered with tombstones. Tombs. So that all the Jews will be right there when the Messiah comes. And they'll be able to come right up out of the graves and join him. Right next door to Jerusalem. Okay, so you've got the temple here, this huge valley that's the Kidron Valley, the huge mountain that's the Mount of Olives, and just beyond the Mount of Olives, over the top of it, is a little place called Bethany, where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived. Okay? The last week of Jesus' life, less than two miles from the temple, Jesus raises Lazarus back from the dead after being dead for four days in front of the entire city of Jerusalem. And everybody was very impressed. And I'm going to just do this because Satan said, if you jump down and let everybody see you fall, then the angels catch you. They'll be very impressed. Three years later, he's raising Lazarus from the dead less than two miles away. Gets the same result. It's just interesting. When you know the, the little bit of something of how it's put together, you know, that's how it happens. Now, this down here is the city of David. This is a mountain this big. This is a mountain this big. And it stops right here. So this little tiny city right here is all that David ever knew. This was all built later. And then there's a valley in here. It's called the Trophil Valley. And then this is another mountain on this side. And this is where Herod's palace is. And Caiaphas' house, the high priest's house. And the upper room is right up here just a couple of blocks away. And they're up on the top of the mountain. Why is it important that we know about the mountains and the valleys. Any idea? <laughs> I no. hate to be gross. Irrigation and sanitary. So you you wanna you wanna be at the top. <laughs>
As the saying, um, I think with my something nose. That, something that goes downhill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something that runs downhill, basically. Yeah. This little mark note down here is called the dung gate. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. There is no sewer system. There is no piped in water. The streets are beveled as they had been for a thousand years that the Jerusalem has been occupied so that there's a little sway around through the middle. Mm -hmm. And any donkey poop or anything else that has been thrown out the door of the houses runs to the middle of the street and downhill from all directions down through this Trophil Valley mm -hmm. and out through a hole in the wall and down into the valley we call Gehenna, uh -huh, yeah. just outside the Dung Gate. Do you know what Gehenna is? It's the easily burning things there. It's, it's, it's the, the dump. trash dump, yeah. It's the dump for the city of Jerusalem. <laughs> and you always hope the breeze is coming from the north. <laughs> you never like it when the breeze is coming from the south. Okay? What's another name for Gehenna? What would it be if you translated it into Greek? It's translated as Hades. Oh, yeah. And if we translate it into English, what do we call it? Um, hell. Hell. Yeah. Great. outside the wall in Jerusalem. Probably smells like it. Um, I don't remember where I heard this, but something about, is that the same thing? I don't know how to ask the question, actually. I don't know how to word it. Um, like the day of sacrifice, when everybody was sacrificed, yes. I heard that all the blood ran down. Is that the same That's thing? the altar. Actually, the altar up here in the temple, in the front end of the temple, right, right. here, has channels cut down okay. through the rock. Okay. And it actually flows out and flows out through the gate and out into the valley so of blood, which is Gehenna. Okay. Gehenna. Because yeah. I heard something about like when they were walking to different areas, they had to step over different pieces of that to get to. And it's mm -hmm. so blood and dump. Mm -hmm. oh. When one of the emperors of uh, Rome decided they wanted to do a census, of what it was like for the Roman governors at Passover in Jerusalem. They insisted uh, different from the custom of the day that the priest cut out one of the organs on each sacrifice and throw it into a pile. On Passover, the Friday before Passover, the day of preparation, all right, this is a calendar right here that shows the day of preparation. The day of preparation, the day of preparation. They would sacrifice the animals, offer them for the forgiveness of sins, and they would throw one of the organs over into the pile. When the, or when the ordeal was done, they went back and numbered how many of those organs were there. And they totaled over 600,000 individual sacrifices on the day of preparation in Jerusalem at Passover. Now you take that, each lamb would have fed a family. Maybe as many as 10, probably not as many as a dozen and you multiply that many sacrifices times that many people. Every available space to put your tent, to have a place to share, to live in for that week, was completely filled for about a five mile So, At least two miles. On Passover, you were not allowed to travel, walk, more than two miles. And if you were going to have your sacrifice and go to the temple on Passover to worship, you had to be within a two-mile radius. It was the most excruciating... I think you one mile radius, wasn't it? You can go two. Because what about is two and back? Yeah, two and back. Okay. 
You could walk to Bethany and back. It was within a, a, a Sabbath day's journey. Okay? Now, I want you to just kind of get a picture of that because sometimes we talk about Jerusalem. He went here. He was doing this. He went to the temple. He did that. Well, where is all this stuff? How does it fit together? And so that's part of what we're going to be doing. And Okay. I want to just continue our little experiment here just a little bit to get voice. All right? Verse 29, chapter 1. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me suppresses me. I'm going to give you a jump down here to 32. Then John gave them this testimony. And here's what he said. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, there will be, there is a man on whom you will see the Spirit come down and remain. He is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. End of quote. I have seen and testify that this is God's chosen one. Now, how did he know? Before he was sent, he was told what to look for. On that day, Jesus appeared, and that's the Lamb of God. Because I have seen the Spirit of God come down in the form of a dove and land and stay on him. This is God's chosen one. Verse 35, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus said to them, following, saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and, I, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two. The big question, who was the other one? John. The only one it could be. Yeah. It's the only one it could be. All right? On your handout. In the first paragraph, underlined first, he was a priest. Did you know that one of Jesus' disciples was a priest? Does it ever say that he was a priest? Then how can we know he was a priest? Why? <laughs> no, no, let me do it differently. What gives me the right to say he's a priest? <clears throat> I will be explaining that as we go along. <laughs> okay? He had to be a priest. There's no way you can have anybody who does not have the priestly connection walk into the Sanhedrin council and listen to the discussion that he had heard. There's no way that he could have been in the trial of Jesus at Caiaphas' house if he had not been in the family of the high priest. Uh, maybe you haven't read the little story of, of how Jesus uh, actually was betrayed by Peter. You remember the story? Aren't you one of the ones with him? No, 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 it wasn't me. I don't know. Three times. Three times. How did he get in that terrible spot? How did he end up in the courtyard of the high priest of the Jewish faith? In the middle of the courtyard, close enough that he could actually look inside the doorway and see Jesus standing in there at the middle of the trial. His buddy got him in. His buddy got him in. Who was his buddy? <laughs> because Peter was a, was a fisherman from Galilee. What does a fisherman dress like? 
Justin. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a t-shirt, nice printing, you've got the nice thing, you've got all caps on backwards. You know, does that look like a priest? Sure. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. They had no casual Fridays in the priesthood. All right? It was always dressed to the teeth in the priesthood. Okay? So they're coming from the Garden of Gethsemane. They're following the soldiers. They're walking along. They get to the house of Caiaphas. John walks through the gate, walks right in, walks completely through the courtyard and right into the house where Jesus is being tried. Whoops. Looks back. Where'd Peter go? He was right beside me. He got stuck at the gate. He didn't have his credentials. He didn't have his pass. So John leaves the trial, walks back through the courtyard, takes the guard that's at the gate and said, he's with me. You can let him in. And he's the only Galilean fisherman in the entire block. He stands out like a sore thumb. He even smells different than the rest of the people who live in Jerusalem. You can't get that smell out of your clothes. Not after you've been fishing that long. Aren't you one of them? I know, I remember you. You were with them. I saw you. Remember, he just cut off Malachus's ear. He's sort of a character they would recommend, remember. And because... John let him into that mess. We're going to say it's John's fault that Peter betrayed Jesus, okay? <laughs> Is it true? No, no. But he wouldn't have been there if John hadn't given him a chance. And so at every point you look, now we're going to study the whole Gospel of John, we're going to look at it, but you're going to begin to start to see how crazy interesting this becomes because there's no place that's off limit for him he is totally bonkers he knows everybody he is recognized by everyone he is not a stranger because Jerusalem is his hometown he was born and raised there his house is high up on the hill you remember what happens to the stuff that goes down here and out the... His house is up here in the high rent district just a block or two from Caiaphas' house. It's a big place too. A room big enough about twice this room size. No poor man's house. How do I know he's a priest? How do I know he's a priest? Now let's just take one example. I'm trying to save myself from sounding like a kook. So I'm going to give you one more example. When Jesus said, I'm preparing for the Passover to spend with you on the last week of his life, he sent his disciples into Jerusalem with instructions on who to talk to. I remember what the city looks like. 600,000 sacrifices on the next day. Packed with people. Everywhere. All hollering. All arguing. Trying to get enough elbow room just to survive. And what's the thing that Jesus said will be the person they're supposed to look for? There'll be a man carrying a water jar. You gotta be kidding. There must be a thousand men carrying water jars, right? There's only a few springs in Jerusalem. Everybody has to have water. Right? Except it was a woman's job. 
the woman was supposed to go get the water for the family. Each had the job description, so it was kind of traditional. The woman went to the well and picked up the water jug and brought it back to the family. Why would there be a man carrying a water jug if that is a woman's job? I'm sorry? I said if there was no woman. Yeah, or a servant. Or a servant. Let's go backwards in tradition just a little bit. In the history of Israel, the priesthood were supposed to stay ceremonially clean. Okay? How do you stay ceremonially clean? There were a whole bunch of forbidden things. You couldn't touch a dead body. You couldn't even be in the vicinity of a dead body. I mean, dead bodies were unclean by definition. All right? You couldn't walk through a cemetery, and you couldn't be touched by a woman or touch anything a woman had touched. Because, periodically, a woman's body becomes untouchable by a man. Sort of a rule. Okay? And for a priest, you never knew whether that particular lady was in her unclean time or in her clean time. You didn't know just what was happening. And she might not even know. And so just to be on the safe side, they had a whole group of people called Levites. They were men, descendants of the tribe of Levi, who served in the household of the priest. When you went to a priest's home, there were no servant girls. For fear that by accident one of them would touch you or touch something that you would be handed, and then you would have to go through the seven day purification process and you couldn't serve in the temple for the holy days. Okay? So what were they going to? They were going to a priest's home to prepare for the Passover. How do we know it was a priest that was the host? Because he always sat exactly alongside of the guest of honor. Remember the story of the Last Supper with Jesus? I'm going to be betrayed by one of you. And there was one called the beloved disciple who was sitting so close to Jesus, all he had to do was lean over on his shoulder and whisper in his ear, who is it? He was the one who was acting as the host for the meal. And Jesus was the guest of honor. Are you having fun yet? I'm having fun just giving you the insight to say, do you realize, do you realize how intricately involved God's plan was so that there was exactly the right kind of person who could be standing at the foot of the cross, having absolutely no fear of being arrested, absolutely, totally without any kind of embarrassment to be standing right out there in front of God and everybody, including all the Jewish leaders, holding on to the mother of Jesus, trying to comfort her, and Jesus looks down from the cross and says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Now, she is going to be taken care of by a man who will never, ever be poor in his entire life. He will always have enough resources. He will always be able to protect her from any kind of harm. There was never a threat to the mother of Jesus in any of the persecutions that came. Why? He stood there as the great protector. He and Mary lived to be a very, very old, very elderly, in the city of Ephesus. And why would it be Ephesus? 
if you had any recollection from the book of Acts why Ephesus would be of an interesting place for them? You don't really think about this during the journeys of Paul, why would you? you know, what, what makes Ephesus interesting for a place where Mary would end up? Artemis was there. Artemis. Artemis. But there was also a great number of priests that had fled Jerusalem that gathered in. If you remember the story of Ephesus, there's a group of, of priests who were casting out demons and things, and all of a sudden the demon turns them and says, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? It's righteous. <laughs> Quite a congregation of priests that had gathered in Ephesus as a place where the priesthood generally left and came and gathered in clusters after being driven out of Jerusalem. Okay? 30, 66 or 67. 70 was, was that the, uh, was the temple that was destroyed. Yep, Romans. But they had been gathering there for some time. Yeah. The persecution took years and years and years to develop and bring to the point of where they, you know. But these are Christ follower priests. Okay? They're casting out demons in Jesus' name. Followers of Jesus. We have fun. We're going to look at John. We're going to look at what makes him unique. We're going to look at a bunch of the things. The, that handout is uh, a key to that. You can look down through it. It's a thick piece. It's to try and challenge your brain, uh, kind of give you an idea of why testimony is so important, uh, give you an idea of why um, John has some of the dialogues, the long dissertations. If you read the Gospel of John, it's almost like reading some of Paul's work. And there's this argument of this and this and that goes to this and then this step comes in and you read down through there and it almost looks like he's building a legal case. That's the way Paul does when he's writing. And because he's been trained just as Paul has through the Pharisee mm -hmm. tradition, he went through the priesthood tradition. Okay? I, I hope this is going to be fun for you because I just want you to understand when John whispers into that microphone so that you can know for sure. And so that you can know, you can actually hear the words. Remember the last words that Jesus said to Peter? This is after he's resurrected and they're now in Galilee and he's been fishing one time and you know he's, uh, he's 153 <coughs> fish came into the net and, and Jesus takes him aside and he asks him one question. Do you love me? What's Peter's answer? Or you know I love you. Again. Peter, do you love me? You know all things. You know I love you. Peter, do you love me? You love me? You know I love you. And who does Peter turn and see just close enough to overhear the conversation? Yeah. That's a double up disciple. <laughs> Yeah. What about him? <laughs> See, it's if he hadn't been close enough to hear, we would say, Peter, you didn't share that with us in your gospel. Why didn't you share that in your gospel? See, Mark is Peter's gospel. Mark is the secretary that wrote it down, but it's Peter's sermons, if you want to put it that way. So why didn't you put it in your book? John did. It was a very, very important part of the message. 